Good morning, everybody. It is the hour in Greenwich Mean Time, distributed across the globe. We are just allowing participants time to, to log in. It, it takes a little while for everyone to, to stream through the virtual doors of the digital portal. So far, I see the number of participants has reached 170 in the first minute of entry, which would be a bit more difficult to get them through physical doors. But good morning to everyone and, and welcome. If you will permit me, I would like to welcome you all to the second installment of this online seminar, organized around a reading of Lacan's <laughs> Seminar 17, The Other Side of Psychoanalysis. The presence of each one of you is perhaps eloquent testimony and tribute to the desire at stake in this seminar that was first delivered just over half a century ago in a very different world from ours. It is also maybe a testimony to the desire at stake in Lacan's teaching that this seminar still has the capacity to speak to us today under current conditions. Or perhaps we could put this in the form of a question, one of the primary wages of the organization of this seminar, to ask, in what way does this seminar still speak to us today? There is no need, of course, to remind you of the conditions under which we come together in this particular way. We are all aware of a health crisis with real and severe consequences being played out in different ways in different countries across the globe. Let us spare a thought for those who have been directly affected by this illness. Given that in one way or another, each one of us has been affected by this virus that attacks not just the body, but also the social bond precipitating us all into unprecedented degrees of social isolation and uncertainty. Let us also not overlook the role of digital technology that allows us to congregate together in this virtual way around the reading of this text of Lacan. An affirmation of the bond of transference to the work of Lacan but perhaps also as a way of working out some of the questions that are posed to us by this particular moment. Let us not forget that while we have been, our daily life has been put into suspense, the world is in the process of rapidly reorganizing itself around us. In this work, we seek to prepare ourselves, shall we say, for the challenges to come a reading of the coordinates of the discursive modifications currently underway, which will have implications for each one of us, as well as for the situation of psychoanalysis in the world. We would hope that when the moment comes for the lifting of some of the present restrictions, we will be ready, a little bit better prepared to unleash ourselves as carriers of the virus of the analytic discourse, infected by the parasite of speech and language, acquiring, shall we say, if not immunity, at least some degree of inoculation against some of the more disturbing prospects of the new social, economic, and political discourses to come. I want to thank each one of our speakers and discussants who have so willingly agreed to contribute to the work of this seminar. In particular, I would like to take the opportunity to thank the president of the new Lacanian school, Bernard Senyav, for his support for this project, organized by the London Society under the aegis of the new Lacanian school. The speakers who we will hear from over the course of the next of the 12 weeks of this seminar are mainly drawn from the various groupings making up the new Lacanian school. You will get to know them a little bit better in the course of the coming weeks, as they will also be participating in the panel discussions around each chapter. 
we are also pleased to be able to welcome speakers who are members of some of our sister schools within the World Association of Psychoanalysis. Today, it gives me particular pleasure to be able to welcome Vicente Palomera. Vicente is a member of the Spanish school, the Escuela Lacaniana de Psicoanalysis, and of the World Association of Psychoanalysis. He has a doctorate from the Department of Psychoanalysis at the University of Paris 8. He is a teacher at the clinical section of the Freudian field in Barcelona. He was president of the European Federation of Psychoanalysis between 2007 and 2010. And he is also the author of too many articles and books to mention, including many fine works devoted to the psychoanalytic clinic of the psychosis. Before I hand over to Vicente, I want to say just a couple of quick words about the format of this seminar for those who might be joining us today for the first time. I apologize to those who were not able to attend last time due to restrictions on the capacity of our audience. You will then be pleased to hear that these restrictions have now been resolved. You will accordingly not have to register anew each week in order to participate in this seminar. From now on, invitations will be sent weekly to all those who have previously registered via our website. We will be reading 12 chapters over the course of 12 weeks, each Sunday at this same time until the final session on the first weekend of July, Sunday the 5th of July, when we are pleased to be able to announce that Eric Laurent, previously Delegate General of the World Association of Psychoanalysis, has agreed to speak to us on the final chapter, The Power of the Impossibles. The full program with the lineup of speakers is now available to view on the website of the London Society, or if not now, it will be imminently. You are each free, of course, to circulate this information to anyone who might not yet be aware of this activity and might be interested in participating. We have allowed one and a half hours for each seminar. One hour for the speaker to elaborate some questions around the theme of their chosen chapter, staying as close to a reading of the text as they wish, followed by some remarks by a designated discussant, the role filled today by Gabriela van den Hoven, member of the London Society, the New Lacanian School and the World Association of Psychoanalysis. There will also be scope for interventions from the panelists who you see on the screen made up by the speakers and discussants who will be working with us over the course of these 12 weeks. No doubt each one of you will also have your own questions provoked by your own reading of these chapters. I encourage you to make use of the chat function, which you will find in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. This will allow you to inscribe your own comments and questions as we go along. These comments and questions will be visible to all the other participants, allowing you some degree of interchange with the other members of the audience. This clearly does not mean that every question will receive its answer or even necessarily reach its addressee. But I am sure that you will appreciate not just the technical limitations of the digital format, but also that in psychoanalysis, the questions are far more valuable than the answers, given that in the end, it is the questions that drive the work forward and support our desire. Having said that, I'm now pleased to be able to pass the word to Vicente, as I am as eager as you are to hear some of the questions that might have been provoked in him by his renewed encounter with this chapter. Vicente. Good morning to everybody. Um, a, a few words before I start, um, just to thank you for the invitation to the London Society. Um, 
it, I remember that um, 33 years ago, I was invited um, to, to, to give a seminar in, in London, in, I think in the late 80s. And uh, I was asked to talk about the ethics of hysteria. Um, from now, from now on, in this seminar, um, we have to tackle the question of how to read uh, Lacan's seminar, at 17, seminar 17, a seminar that was given at a time when politics took to the streets. Uh, there was a time uh, where Lacan did not hesitate to go looking for a new discourse of the master, that of the university, a discourse thrown into question by students, the front page of seminar, the, the French edition, it's very, uh, you remember very well this, this photograph with um, the police and facing, gone bandit facing the police. So you see that Lacan, it's a, it's a, this photograph highlights the fact that Lacan did not hesitate to go looking for a new discourse of the master, this discourse called the university, the, the discourse of the university, a discourse that was at that time thrown into question by students in revolt against against it, against the master, as well as against other, other institutions that were also under the sway of the master's discourse. The chapter, this, this lesson, the second lesson, is devoted to the couple master hysteric. It's a, it's a, in fact, it is a, a couple we find throughout history. The question maybe is to, to know what is it present is what is its present configuration and also about the responsibility hysteria bears for this present state in the world. Let us remember that Lacan in Radiophonie stay, stated hysteria as the unconscious. An exercise, unconscious, an exercise, uh, um, maybe translated as the unconscious in action. I don't know whether it is a good translation. Uh, in this chapter, Lacan points out that it is by a regression effect that is operated the passage to the hysterics discourse. Lacan declares that science takes off from the discourse of the hysteric. So, clearly, hysteria is in the origin of the desire that gives rise to science, that pushes the master discourse to know. This thesis leaves no room for the Hegelian master-slave dialectic, as Lacan shows in this seminar, and makes science the response to hysteria's provocation. This runs from Socrates to Freud. Socrates is described as hysteric since he said that he knew nothing except matters of desire. It took Socrates, Lacan calls him the pure hysteric. It took Socrates to, uh, I don't know whether you say it in English, insuflar, insufflate. I'm afraid I don't know what the English would be. Inflate maybe, or- Inflate, to give uh, air, to insufflate, to inspire. Suscitate or- Suscitate. Yeah. The inspire. desire to know, yes, the inspire the desire to know. 
from which science issued, involving a transformation of knowledge by science from artisanal knowledge to universe, universal, universalizable, well, formalized uh, knowledge. Uh, I came across, while reading this chapter, I came across uh, an intervention Lacan um, gave at that time, uh, at the end of this, I think that in uh, in the in the in an intervention Lacan gave in in March, uh, nineteen seventy, um, which you find you will find it in uh, Silly Set two three. Um, a discourse. Address, address, it's an allocution, it's an allocution uh, à la clôture de l'école freudienne de Paris, where Lacan uh, talks about the, the four discourses. And it is very interesting to find that the discourse, the discourses, Lacan, um, the discourse, uh, better say, the discourse are always appended to a saying a saying, uh, that is to say, the discourse are appended to some, uh, uh, someone, the discourse is appended to a saying means that it is incarnated in history for each one by a historical figure. Lacan names in this allocution, uh, when, he, when he talks about the master discourse, the discourse of the master, he, he names Lycurg Lycurgus, the, the, the Spartan ruler, Charlemagne for the discourse of the university, Socrates for that of the hysteric, and of course Freud for the analyst. It is very interesting because this is something which is going to take a very important place in, in Lacan's teaching, revealing that, um, because Lacan in this chapter, in this second lesson, is, is going to talk about the interpretation, uh, the enigma and citation, the quotation. Uh, and it, this is very important because Lacan points, points at the question of not so much what is said, but the fact of saying. This is why Lacan will start speaking, uh, uh, speaking about the question of the utterance, the saying, the, 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 the saying as an event. So these four discourses, that are appended to a saying to someone who started this new uh, new uh, adventure in in human history the discourse of the master uh, appended to Lycurgus Charlie Mann and the discourse of the of the university Socrates in the hysteria and Freud uh, the, the miracle the, the enigma the riddle of the of the uh, beginning of the analytical practice, um, Lacan shows us the articulation between a discourse and the enigma that this or the origin of this discourse uh, implies. So Lacan shows us in this seminar that while knowledge cannot articulate the hysteric, the hysteric ushers the articulation of knowledge. The hysteric role regarding knowledge is because this is the first point I wanted to to highlight. I, I have chosen three 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 aspects of this uh, lesson. First, the first one is the question of knowledge. A knowledge Lacan, uh, when Jacques-Alain Miller uh, uh, isolates this first 
the first point, uh, writing knowledge that is not known. I will tackle, secondly, the question of hysterization, which is a very important point in this chapter, hysteria, hysterization. And the third point, citation and interpretation. So now I'm entering, I'm, I'm, I'm going into the question of the knowledge that is not known, which is something related, which is at the heart, we could say at the heart of the four discourses in, in the quest, is the question of the desire to know. So Lacan uh, explicitly begins with the question of the desire to know in, uh, in the four discourses. Uh, with regards to the question of the, the desire to know in hysteria, it is clear that um, the, the problem is that, uh, as Lacan shows, is that knowledge cannot articulate the hysteric. On the hysteric on her side, ushers the articulation of knowledge. This, the hysteric's role regarding knowledge is precisely ambiguous, says Lacan. She solicits knowledge by offering, sometimes offering herself as its precious object, compelling to always generate more knowledge. But on the other hand, her solicitation pushes knowledge to its limits demonstrating the, that knowledge does not coincide with the truth that is supposedly that it supposedly expresses. That is, disengaged from the truth, knowledge fails to account for hysteria. As the subject who exhibits the symptom as an enigma for knowledge, the hysteria pushes the one to whom she addresses her question to know. This is what Lacan says when he, in Radiophonie, uh, categorizes hysteria as, the, as he or she who puts the master, you know, challenges the master to produce, to work, to produce a knowledge. Pushes those, he pushes the one to whom she addresses her questions to know and to produce a knowledge. She offers herself as a ravishing enigma. Lacan devotes uh, uh, some time to, to talk about the enigma, the riddle. The symptom, uh, the hysterical symptom uh, is presented as a riddle. Who am I? The subject of this saying, of this utterance, this enunciation, enunciation remains in the air as long as it has not found articulation by means of a statement. So the notion of hysteria has a riddle, as a riddle, has more than descriptive value. Hysteria as a riddle is a riddle. Hysteria is a riddle and remains a riddle. And nothing truer can be said of a riddle than saying it is, a, it is an enigma. It is a riddle. Paradoxically, the only true answer to the question, what is hysteria, as Lacan says, is not answering. This is the Freud's response. There are then two possible positions. First, answer the question and produce knowledge. Or secondly, speak the truth, but don't answer the question, which is uh, what Freud uh, did. I said that at the, heart, at the heart of the four discourses is the question of the desire to know, insofar as the master does not wish to know anything, and the university only prolongs this ignorance by stamping knowledge with the mark of an all 
all that governs the production of what in the university is called units of value. In Spain, we say modulos, modules of value. This totalization of knowledge, the idea that knowledge can make a whole, Lacan says, this idea that knowledge can make a whole in a, is according to Lacan, immanent in page 31, he says, immanent in politics as such. The very interesting point raised by Lacan at this moment. It is part of the imaginary idea of the whole that is given by the body as drawing on the good form of satisfaction on what, says Lacan, on what ultimately forms a sphere. This idea of the, of the, of the knowledge as a whole, hmm? as a sphere, and that has always been, said Lacan, says Lacan, ben, has always been used in politics by the party of political preaching. Page 31. The analytic experience puts knowledge in a central place without making closed totality. Lacan here makes uh, obviously a reference to academic skepticism who called into question the all knowledge, to savoir, the totalization of, this, of the knowledge. This idea of a totality of knowledge is a political idea, I insist. Note that this has never been so striking uh, as today, with body images in TV, especially those of politicians filling our screens. This I found, I came across with um, an intervention Lacan gave one week previous to this uh, session, this lesson, Lacan gave a lesson in Advancant, uh, December the 3rd. While addressing the audience, he said, this has a very important consequence, says Lacan, especially for the revolutionary. Nothing, well, in French he says, rien, rien n'est tout. That is, Render, I rendered, uh, uh, nothing is all in English. Rien n'est tout. It's interesting because Lacan articulates a critique of the quest for the one, for this totality, this sphere, the quest uh, for the one, be this one the truth, the knowledge, be this, this one the system, the system, the revolution, the nation, arguably the most salient contemporary manifestation of an impulse to totalizing knowledge that he saw as characteristic of the political as such. Nothing is all. This nothing is all lays, according to me, the ground for an alternate logic of revolutionary or Let's put it in another way. The rotational, as we are, we were talking last Sunday. Maria Len was talking about the rotation of the of this quadrupod. No, uh, the lo the alternate logic of the ro rotational exemplified by the four discourses. The fantasy, Lacan, in these interventions, with this, nothing is all. The fantasy of a oneness, a oneness. Uh, that Lacan links to the essence of the signifier is illustrated several times in this lesson by the sphere. Remember that this is another uh, uh, the image that Lacan gives us about the body in seminar 23. No, the, the, the body image as a sphere. Uh, in the discourse of the analyst, when Lacan tackles the question of the, the discourse of the analyst, the place of knowledge, knowledge, says Lacan, is on his side. It is true when you, you see the quadrupod of the 
analytic discourse, we see that on the side of the analyst, the, the, the knowledge is there. Uh, the, his, Lacan says on, it is on his side and he acquires, I quote, he acquires this knowledge through listening to his analysis. It's, an, it's a, a knowledge that one acquires through listening. Page 35. This is indeed a transference of knowledge. And at a certain level, says Lacan, it can be limited to analytical know-how. Page 35. Thus, via trans this transference, the analyst will approach this knowledge as truth, that is to say, as something that is not a whole and can only be half said. Midir. This knowledge as, as truth, as a half saying, is the very structure of the interpretation expected from an analyst. This is supposed to lead to a knowledge with, to which the analyst make, makes himself, Lacan says, a hostage. A, a knowledge of which he is prepared in advance to be the product of the psychoanalyst, psychoanalysis co cogitation, says Lacan, insofar as, as this product, he is in the end destined to become a loss, to be eliminated from the process. Uh, page 30, 38. Lacan highlights then the fact that the analytic experience is based on the fact that, at least ordinarily, we do not know what we say. In fact, this is the rule of the free association. It's an invitation to say what we do not do, know. And when we listen to this, when we read Lacan, this we do not know what we say means that what we intend to say is not the truth of what we say. The agent of speech in the, in the analytical discourse conveys a meaning unknown to him. Far, for, far for, from being the master of meaning, the analyst acts in the words of Jacqueline Miller as its appointed functionary. Lacan says hostage. Lacan, uh, well, it could be, we could make a, a, a comparison, uh, an analogy with uh, host, hostage is uh, something very, a, very akin to to the plague, no, something function as a as a virus. But like, but Miller says that the analyst, far from being the master of meaning, the analyst acts as its appointed functionary. In a moment, like uh, Jacqueline Miller said that the well, the function of the of the uh, uh, of the analyst is to well, the analyst functions as a as an editor, as an editor of the the process of reading, you know, the book of the unconscious, of the, of the script, of, which is in every one of us uh, of this unconscious. Thus the agent of this analytical discourse, the agent suffers the truth rather than delivering it. The analyst suffers the truth rather than delivering, delivering it. His place only seems to be one of acting subject, a semblance brought in by speech as such. Second point, uh, hysterization. What does Lacan mean with the word hysterization? Well, first of all, we all know that Freud wrote about the hysterical, uh, we say in Spanish, nucleo, nucleo hysterical, the hysterical core of neurosis in general. 
Lacan defines the hysteria, as I said before, uh, as the subject of the unconscious in action. The problem is here the notions, the notion of unconscious. It's true that Freud chose the word, although we know that it is not the best, the best term. To say what the unconscious is, to say what the unconscious is, the most simple name, to say what the unconscious is, I'm sorry, <clears throat> um, to me it's um, to go to the, to the Traumdeutung, to the interpretation of dreams, where Freud names the unconscious with a simple name, that of desire. So one of the names of the unconscious is desire. Desire is here, is the desire in as much as the subject doesn't know him or herself what he or she wants. And so the Freudian rule of free association aims precisely at making the subject say what he or she doesn't know. And that whoever, and that however, is present in his symptoms, in his or her behavior and speech. So the hysterical position is that of a subject who is naturally plucked, um, at, connected to the question of desire. especially plagued to the question of the desire of the other. On the contrary, we see that the obsessional subject, his own position is um, to put a shield to annul, annul the, the other's desire. So the, the hysterical subject is haunted by the problem of knowing who he or she is as enigma. And as a consequence, the hysterical subject has a particular relationship with knowledge. He questions knowledge, and as a result, he loves every success of knowledge and feels a passion towards knowledge. The hysterical subject, the hysterical subject is especially a lover of masters of knowledge, no matter in what domain. So he questions knowledge. But on the other side, being a subject who absol absolutize the question of desire and of being, he is never satisfied with the knowledge produced. With regards to the question of appropriating the knowledge, we find it as a difficult task for the hysterical subject. We find all kinds of phenomena like, for instance, I have read all the books, but I don't remember anything. Obviously, when one aims in the text or the speech, the mystery, the riddle of unconscious enunciation utterance, in conscious utterance, the mystery of what does it want, the thing, what does it want, one is never satisfied with no statement. So all of a sudden these statements evacuate in oblivion. This means that hysteria is not so interested in the set, what is said, but the saying, why do you say what you say? So then, all the set is um, evacuated in oblivion. 
So what we call hysterization, or Lacan calls hysterization, is a necessary, ne necessary stage where the subject encounters the presence of the enigma of the desire of the other. When he, the present, when the subject encounters the presence of the enigma of the other's desire. An enig enigma from which the subject protected himself or his thoughts with his thoughts in the case of the obsessional by means of a strategy of annihilation. So hysteri hysterization is the necessary condition to enter in psychoanalysis insofar as it makes present the dimension of the unknown desire and with it an appeal to the subjects supposed to know. Finally, third point, citation interpretation. Uh, I will take uh, and I will thank uh, Philip Travers yesterday because he uh, helped me to translate it into English. Condis reste oublié dans que c'est dit. It's a phrase, it's a, sen it's a, a sentence uh, taken from Les Tourdis. Sometime later, this uh, seminar, uh, Lacan writes this, but it is present in uh, in the following teaching, Lacan's teaching from 1969 onwards. The translation that one might be saying remains forgotten behind what is said in what is heard. I think this is very important to, to understand the, the step that Lacan is going to do in this seminar concerning, regarding the question of interpretation. Let's say the question, as, uh, as I pointed uh, out in the second point, um, this hysterization, um, everything hinges um, on the question of desire until 1967 69 and 1970 the object a was characterized as a, the cause of desire by lacan so to define what desire is to give a satisfactory definition of desire we could say that a desi um, desire is what pushes what pushes, what causes, no? What leads someone from one position towards another. Well, Freud said that what pushes is the drive. And Lacan gives a satisfactory this definition of desire, saying that it is what causes the object A. But Saying this, Lacan re <coughs> recognizes that this does not say where this desire points at. Lacan in this seminar precises, gives us a position that he, he says that there is a second cause of desire, not only the object A as a cause that would, would pushes the, the desire, but he says that there is the plus of jouissance, plus of jouissance. To redefine the object A as plus of jouissance means not only saying towards what points the desire at, but also saying the cause of desire. To, to sum up, uh, there is no desire that does not, that not, uh, that there is no desire that doesn't uh, point at a, pl a plus of jouissance. That's why Lacan 
from now on will not maintain the opposition between desire and jouissance. Because both what pushes desire, the object A, pushes the movement of desire and the search for jouissance does not allow to maintain this opposition between desire and jouissance. That's why Lacan is, this is what led Lacan to build the four discourses. There are no discourses that are not discourses of jouissance. Even um, Lacan in Le Tourdi speaks of the, um, the races of discourses, a, cer a certain uh, racism of the discourses. Every discourse is a discourse that organizes uh, the envelope the, by means of the signifiers that the envelope that envelope the Jewish songs. So the question that Lacan puts here is the desire of the analyst is the desire of the analyst points at a plus of Jewish songs, a plus of Jewish songs. Uh, with the discourses, Lacan introduces a, a supplementary dimension in the structure. Lacan writes the discourses with these letters S1, uh, S2, notice the, the signifying chain, S1, S2, the object produced by language, the object A. But be, beside this, there are four places. The, the, the place of the truth, the agent, the other, and the product, the, the product. And Lacan, but Lacan does not say how this Places are produced, but these places suppose the dimension which is not that of language, but suppose that they belong to a dimension which is that of saying. That's why I, I recalled this. Um, reference Lacan gave, gave in, in his allocution uh, in the Ecole Freudienne de Paris, where he appended every discourse to a name, saying all these places, suppose that you mention of language, but also of uh, the appearing of a, a discourse in, in history, is, is, rela is related with the question of the saying. Saying is an event. And what, that's why Lacan is, will start speaking about événement de discours, an event of discourse. Saying that an event, but to differentiate événement de discours, event of discourse, from événement de jouissance. Uh, Saying event, we could say, an event of jouissance. This you will find it in uh, Le Tourdi, uh, 1972. And that's why I took that, uh, that sentence, that statement that you find in the Le Tourdi, that one may be, might be saying remains forgotten behind what is said in what is heard. This sentence highlights the event. Saying is an event, is the only testimony of existence. If Lacan at the, at the beginning of his teaching taught that desire, he placed desire between Signify the signifiers, what what he called um, le dit entre interdict entre dit, uh, what is said between. So at the beginning of his teaching, Lacan placed desire 
in what is said between signifiers. Now, Lacan points when talking about interpretation to what pushes to say, not the saying, not the sets, but the saying, what pushes to say. That's why Lacan points to, says that it's, this place is a mute. When he, um, when, he, when he spoke about the truth, uh, la vérité je parle, the truth uh, speaks, uh, uh, I the truth speak, this I speak, Lacan places this I speak, the truth, on the side of the signifying chain. To speak is to speak with the signifiers. We cannot speak without signifiers, but why not to, but why talk and not be quiet? It's a question of knowing if there is in the speech acts something with what that, um, that uh, Austin and the, some pragmatic of linguistics speak. To speak is to speak with the signifiers. It, the question now is to know if there is an act of a speech act, uh, and this changes the question of interpretation. That is to say, the changing is that interpretation points at what is set between the signifying chain. This is what Lacan said at the beginning, but now it seems that uh, the the aim changes. What points the interpretations at? The interpretation does not point at what is entre deux, inter, uh, set between desire. What we interpret is the saying of the demand the word of the analysant, which develops in the signifying chain, the images or the saying or the sets, the sets, uh, what is said that can be recorded, that could be, um, uh, you could, take notes of what is said. Well, Lacan says this is not what is interpreted. What is interpreted is what is the fact that it is said. The fact of saying, not the said, but the saying. All the saying of the analysant is a saying of demand. A saying of demand supposes an other, at the other at towards uh, the other at, to, uh, to one one is addressing what it is interpreted is demand is the demand and that's why it is useless to take notes of the set of the annoncé. The set is not going to tell, they are not going to formulate what is the demand. And that's interesting because it's exactly what Lacan uh, takes uh, in the post fast of seminar 11. He introduces this, remembering the Jewish history, why? 
did you tell me that you were going to crack off? This history evokes the truth that is formulated in the sayings. Uh, what is, you say, you say that you go to Krakow. This is uh, like a mixture of lie and truth that obliges us to, or obliges me to look for what is in the in what is said, what is true. This history allows us to distinguish the difference between why, which is the hysterical question, why do you say this? Why do you tell me this? Which is different from what do you say? Why do you say this? Why do you tell me? Points at the cause of desire of the of the saying. So I'm going to just finish um, the interpretation because Lacan is talking about uh, quotation, citation, uh, the interpretation taking one part of the, what the subject says, uh, 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 introducing it as a half set, pushing the question of the saying. Why do you say this? To what, uh, what, uh, in, to, the question is what the interpretation aims at. Uh, and it is not, what Lacan says, it is, it is not what is, uh, what is said in the word, in speech, what must be interpreted. Lacan says that the demand leads to a plus of jouissance. The object A as a lack is the rail, the path through which demand gets to the plus of jouissance. So interpretation points to the aim of desire and not the cause. Desire points at the plus of jouissance. The desire, the, thus Lacan finally points out to what, not only what pushes desire, but towards where does the, this, what pushes desire, demand, the demand. I, I already said that uh, uh, the desire is, if Lacan reminds this, desire is incompatible with the word that sustains uh, fantasy. And that uh, fantasy is, a, is a, something fixed, a constant. Fantasy is the real of desire. There is no dialectics, it's a fixed point like uh, fantasy, uh, like uh, a child is being beaten, is a fixed point, no dialectics. The word that runs is a fixed center. And here Lacan points to another thing, points to, to, where, to where the desire points at. Finally, desire, this is what we learn from hysteria, desire, there's a, a desire sustaining the, an, uh, the event of a saying is something independent from the enigma of the other. The event is contingency, It is, there is no genealogy, genealogy of uh, events of saying. And that's why Lacan appended a name to every discourse, because every discourse it supposed, the opening of every discourse supposed a whole, a new, something new in the history, something 
which is not connected to the determinations of the big other, of the history of the determinations. The event is a contingency. It's something enigmatic. And that's why we, we can see this in the case of Freud, what Lacan called Freud event, that is to say, there is a very, import, very important book. We, we must uh, remember this book from Serge Coté, Le Désir de l'Analyste, which is a book devoted to the question of this Freud event. That is to say, a desire, a de desire that has no antecedent, that has no history, uh, which is a, a riddle as such. What Lacan calls Freud event is a desire that cannot be explained by this something precedent. In psychoanalysis, the operation of saying is another thing. Saying is a mystery, impossible to program. And we can only grasp it when it takes place. Uh, I'm gonna stop here and leave you the word, the floor or the, the screen. <laughs> Vicente, I, I would like to thank you personally for that, that tour you have given. And most of all, shall we say, for the way that you have responded to my, to my demand, to my request that, that you speak to us. I, I will tell you that actually the alacrity with which Vicente uh, responded to my request, he responded almost immediately. In fact, there was only one other person who responded even quicker where the response came almost be before the question had gone. But Vicente responded immediately and said, when, how soon, let's do it. A testimony to the desire and to the embodiment of the act of speaking that, 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 that we have just witnessed. This, shall we say, masterly trajectory through this chapter and the questions, but suffused with, with the desire and a questioning that, 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 that testifies to the index of, of that desire. I myself have been taking notes about what Vicente has said, but as he pointed out, that doesn't necessarily help us uh, formulate the questions that each one of us will, will say. I will just say before I pass to Gabriella to, to pose her, his, uh, her questions, that I find it striking that at the launch of the very seminar where Lacan will propose, shall we say, a, a, a discourse without words, Vicente has put the act of saying back at the center of the question of, of, of discourse, allowing us to locate the, this, the, the, the distinction, the division. But, uh, uh, could you play, please say it again? I, 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 I lost. Um, I, I was saying at the launch of the seminar that proposes the formulation of the discourses and the preference for a discourse without words, a discourse without speech, you have put the act of saying back at the heart of the problematic via this distinction between statement and enunciation, enigma and citation, knowledge and truth. Most of all, what, what I found really useful is as you've as embodied in the hysterical discourse, I, I understand much more about that distinction between enigma and citation via the, the question of hysterization, the, the operation of hysterization that you've situated as the threshold of the, the psychoanalytic clinic. But most of all, as you pointed out, that it has, it's something that has to be embodied, putting our body on the line. And under these circumstances where our speaking tends to be more and more digitalized and recorded and filtered and suffused, it is fantastic to hear the, the work of the body put in its place. And for that, I, I thank you and, uh, and we all thank you. Um, Gabriella may have some comments of her own. Gabriella. Thank you, Roger. And thank you, Vicente, for such a rich presentation that um, I'd like to kind of 
interrogate by kind of opening with a question about what you said at the beginning. Um, you start your pa paper saying that in history, uh, there, there is a couple that always goes together, uh, the master and the hysteria. And today we see that there is what we could call um, an epidemia or a pandemic of hysteria. We see that the divided subject is very much present on the scene. Um, so I wonder if perhaps that could enlighten, if you could say something about that, as it might enlighten the relationship between master and hysteria. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, so, um... Shall I respond now or wait? Please, for, okay. say, no, tell uh, us what you can. When um, the, um, uh, it was Philip uh, last time when he recalled uh, La, uh, Lacan's uh, an intervention from Lacan in, in, in Yale, at Yale University at Yale University, uh, talking about the uh, epidemias, the, the history as a um that uh, an epidemia uh that the history of humanity could be uh, um this, uh, the articulation of of the uh, several epidemias epidemics epidemia epidemia no in english is epidemics epidemics not epidemia <laughs> even in spanish is not epidemia <laughs> Yeah, but we, we suffer from it one way or another, yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, epidemia. Um, and Lacan responded that, uh, well, it was a question about the plague. Remember that Marie-Hélène spoke about the question of uh, the Sphinx and the riddle yeah. and the hysteria in Oedipus and the plague. You know? While we are now uh, surrounded by information about the virus and the plague, a very, very uh, important question now. Uh, so uh, let's remember that the history of, um, uh, of the, uh, the history of mankind is related to epidemics, very important epidemics that have changed every time there is an epidemics have changed the world. Uh, every time we speak of epidemics, we, we speak, of course, about um, these virus, these bacteria, viruses, but we don't say anything about um, what is the uh, pandemias and what are these um, parasite, parasites that aff afflict uh, the human being, or the par lettre, as Lacan says, the speaking beings uh, affected by the signifier. Uh, and one of, of um, well, everybody is, uh, agrees with, with Lacan and that Freud invented uh, psychoanalysis thanks to hysteria. Mm -hmm. um, when I heard uh, Philip last time, I thought of, uh, Mm, a question of uh, epidemics and, and remembered uh, um, a doctoral thesis by uh, um, Gerard Vajman, uh, not published in Spanish or English, but very in, it would be very interesting to, to have a translation now. The Le Maître l'hystérique, the master and the hysteric. Mm -hmm. There, um, uh, you see uh, in the description of uh, an epidemic that took place in, um, in a little village in at, at, um, Savoia, La Savoia, La Savoia, Italiana, Italian Savoia. Savoia. Uh, it's, it's a region, in, in the, the village is uh, Morzin, very mm -hmm. nice village in the, in the Alps. Um, he, Bashman, um, in this book, 
I went to to visit this um, to reread re re the book of uh, Gerard Vachement. Re uh, explains very very nicely um, the articulation of the hysterical discourse with the discourse of the master. So, because first of all, there is it's uh, it's an it's an, uh, an, an epidemic that took place uh, during uh, the last uh, uh, between nine, eighteen and fifty six. I remember I'm saying this by by heart. Uh, eighteen fifty six up to nearly eighteen eighty. So nearly twenty years, an epidemia that started. Um, in in this little town, and that in, in first uh, the first is it's a, a hysterodemonopathic a hysterodemopathic uh, hysteria because uh, it, there were cases of possession of the devil and the, there was a, a ten year uh, a ten year old girl that uh, um, that started that's what we could name it as the patient zero no. Um, a girl that uh, that while was while she was preparing the the, um, the first communion, she started with these symptoms of um, faints, uh, falling into a river, etc. So some fits that began spreading all the, the the region. Other girls started with, and so on. The question is that it, it took twenty years to control this epidemic. Uh, and uh, you see how the passage from the church, the scenario, the first scenario is the church with these um, um, uh, ex um, processes of uh, intervention of the priests trying to take the devil from the bodies of these first, there were these young girls, but there were also men and all the women in, in the place. So it took this time to, you see the process of changing from the church and the priest to the, the doctor and the hospital. Uh, the Morzine um, became, uh, this region became um, a part of the French nation. And uh, when the French took possession of this region, then they uh, um, sent from the Salpetriere, Dr. Constant and other med medical doctors to see what was happening because neither the, the church nor the traditional measures helped to give a solution to this epidemic. So it's very interesting the displacement from the discourse of, uh, from the places of the master from the church and the priest to the hospital and the doctor, and also a, a changing of a period. Uh, and this, um, when I um, reread this uh, book from Bajma, I, I remembered also um, the sentence that Lacan, uh, the, 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 the last definition Lacan gives of uh, the hysteria. Lacan says that hysteria, hysteria is, uh, interested in uh, the, uh, the, the, um, the symptom of uh, the, the other's symptoms. Mm -hmm. So he, and he also, that he or the subject, the hysterical subject interests the other in the symptom of the other. I don't have now this um, quotation, but I think that, uh, see, he says that, The capacity, well, uh, we, we could say that the hysterical has a capacity of being interested in, uh, in, others, in the other symptom and thus having interested the social field in other symptoms. We could say that this uh, epidemics in Morzine is an example of how this little girl and others interested the whole community, the whole nation, and even France and the authorities, to interest it in others' symptoms. Uh, the definition of symptom here has the merit of in 
including the intrigue, which is at play here, okay, as a modality of constitution of uh, a kind of link where the hysteric is an agent. But um, in uh, to to be interested in the other symptoms is perhaps something that could be according to your question, the question that I would say, I would put now is, is this symptom of being interested in others' symptoms, is, a domin is, is something dominant in, in uh, the, his the contemporary hysteria, is, is something present now in hysteria. Yeah. Uh, I, I will remember Anna, Berta Pappenheim, Elvis that began with Berta Pappenheim, Anna O. Celebrated as one of the most important uh, uh, social uh, activists in uh, in Germany, mm. we or we could I could we could take the example of Florence Nightingale, the nurse that mm. revolution or uh, the, introduced a revolution. No, so this in, making interest uh, uh, to be interested in other symptoms is perhaps what leads us to understand why we say that there is a very strong uh, relationship between hysteria and the master discourse. Yeah. Uh, uh, Vicente, uh, thank you for your, uh, and thank you for your question, Gabriela, because it, it goes right to the heart of that articulation between the, the master and the hysteric. Because uh, as you yourself pointed out at, at the start, this seminar will trace some, shall we say, of the mutations, the modalities of the modern master, ancient master, modern master, the, the university, science, capitalism, the, the, the mutations, the hybrid mutations of the discourse of mastery all the way to the elaboration of the discourse of capitalism. Perhaps what we, we tend to overlook on the, is the role of the discourse of hysteria as the provocation of some of those changes. And maybe we don't ask often enough about the mutations in the discourse of hysteria that accompany the different mutations in the discourse of, of mastery, including to the point that you suggest, Vicente, where maybe we can think that hysteria is the epidemic. Let's not forget that hysteria has the epidemic <laughs> qualities of, of, of contagion, um, which is why your mention, for instance, of, of Florence Nightingale is, is a fantastic example because was she not the leading figure in the hygienic treatment of, of epidemics of whichever plague that it was? Um, we will allow some comments from, from Vicente unless Gabriella has another question, and then we might throw it open to the panel if anyone else has a comment or a question at that stage. Gabriella, do you have another question that you wanted to pose? Yeah, I have a couple of questions, but I'm just gonna have, want to ask one more question, question before we move to the panel, uh, because it's um, a very pressing question for me, and I think for anyone that is practicing psychoanalysis nowadays, um, you spoke of interpretation, interpretation as an enigma, as a citation, and uh, the desire of the analyst. And the pandemic has kind of forced us to resignify our conception of time and space. Uh, and we find ourselves um, delivering treatments of analysis online or on the phone. Um, I just wanted to know um, or ask you a little bit about what can you say in terms of our interventions um, or the, the effects uh, that analysis done on the phone, um, the problem that it might bring or, or the advantages. I mean, what are your thoughts in terms of the, the current kind of clinical situation of mm -hmm. practice? Well, actually, um, Gabriela is a very important question. You, put, you you raise this question because it's um, um, in it's it's a hard question, I could say. You know, in, in present time, um, there there have been. I I, I must be very humble with uh, the answer because uh, uh, what I'm now doing is uh, 
trying to to learn more from what we call the, the analytical session. Uh, there have been some opinions, comment, uh, comments, some, um, um, some analysts that ex explain their experiences in, in using no, uh, mm -hmm. these uh, tools, these uh, gadgets, these, uh, these um, means that allows us to, to go through this um, strange period of time in, in practice, no? But um, uh, I, would, um, I would say that um, there is something. Is it possible to, to make an analysis by phone? Is it possible to make, well, of course, these are um, tools that can be used, but um, Jacques-Alain Miller, uh, I, I recall, uh, make a, cit a quotation now, Jacqueline Miller Dixit, a quotation. Mm -hmm. um, uh, in uh, le, uh, Los Usos del Lapso, le, Les Usages du Lapsus, uh, du Lapsus, the use of laps, the laps. Laps. Yeah. They use, use we, have it, we have it in Spanish, Los Usos del Lapso. This is, is a, a, a course mm -hmm. by Jacqueline Miller, where uh, the first part is devoted to. Uh, to, it's a research, it's a, um, um, uh, on the question of what is a, uh, the, the, analytic, the, the analytical session. And uh, Lacan responds saying that uh, it is necessary that the analyst puts the body, no, in question, mm -hmm. uh, in order to represent the part that is not symbolized of jouissance, this part of jouissance which is not symbolized. So technology, Miller says, technology um, allows us, uh, without any doubt, to be there when we um, we are talking by phone or by Skype, etc. But being there without the body is not being there exactly. It is not being there. It is not the, the true truth. Mm -hmm. Of course, he, even he says, uh, they will tell you one day that you, you can give the voice, you can give the image, you can give, they can give you tomorrow the, um, the perfume, even they can give you the clone. Mm -hmm. But even then, there won't be in the next millennium, there will be always this part non, not symbolized of jouissance because this part requires the presence of the analyst. You think that this, uh, this is a quotation. This, mm -hmm. this is what is um, my um, um, work now, I'm, I'm, I'm studying, I'm, I'm researching on this, mm -hmm. uh, this phrase, this quotation, because I think it is crucial to understand the limits of the possibilities and also the scope and limits, we could say, the scope and limits of um, um, virtual uh, analysis. That, that, that is an analysis without the presence of the analyst, the presence with the body of the analyst. But um, I say this, it is, and it is a very um, open question, which will be, without any doubt, will be discussed among us in our community of the World Association of Psychoanalysis in the next future. Yeah, if, if not as part of our work over the forthcoming weeks, as we get to grips with, with these questions. Yeah. Um, I know we have a question from Florencia. We then have another question by Susanna. And there's a rather interesting question by Tammy Weil um, on, on the chat. Let's take those three and then we'll see how much, how much room we have for other comments that might be waiting from, from panelists. Florencia, do you still have your question? Uh, 
probably transformed at this stage, but uh, it was to, to thank Vicente and uh, to go back to Gabriela's um, question as well in, in relation to how he began with uh, the pair, let's say the couple, the couple that the hysteric uh, makes with the master and Lacan's idea that uh, the, the hysteric discourse implies the call or the appeal for a complement. In other words, that hysteria <clears throat> is defined by the enactment of an incompleteness that appeals for a partner, a couple. However, Lacan in uh, seminar 23 questions this, questions this when he refers to Helen Sixu version of uh, Dora, the, the play, and perhaps, and what I can't remember now <laughs> is uh, in, in what way Gabriela's question sparked this reference in me, but, there is something perhaps in, in the current version of hysteria to go back to how this can be read in the, in the current situation that uh, doesn't function exactly with that appeal for a complement or a couple. Very, very, very important question, Florencia. <clears throat> I, I, uh, and I, I, I remember very, very well that uh, um, the answer that um, Lacan gives to the question of the rigid hysteria, no, where he, he speaks of this, and the developments that uh, Eric Laurent has made about this subject, about this question. But without going so uh, far as 23, seminar 23, I would say that even in this seminar, at the end of the seminar, perhaps this, as, as Eric Laurent is going to take, uh, is going to, um, to have the word uh, at the end, no, with an intervention. Um, I don't remember the title, but uh, at the end of this seminar, Lacan speaks of the strike the movement, no? uh, mm -hmm. la greffe. Uh, so you could take this, uh, the, the strike of hysteria uh, as um, linked to the, um, the strike with regards to the phallic jouissance. And um, that means that this strike is what uh, we, we could, we foresee uh, in the in the next future as I said before um, so it's this, it's a, it's an appeal to uh, um, something which is not uh, sufficient it's enough which is related to the phallic choices and um, um, this is something which is present already in 1970. And so perhaps this reference to the hysterical strike, that is to say this uh, position that is not, it's not the, the, the question of sleeping, sleeping as an object, sleeping away, no, not being, um, uh, not, not, um, uh, not uh, being limited to the question of the fantasy, the fantasy, not limited by the fantasy operating with as an object with, with uh, this count, uh, this um, complement, finding a complement to with which to find a way of of uh, uh, setting up a theater, no, mm -hmm. it, what Freud called the the hysterical theater. Mm. Um, it goes beyond the question of phallic jouissance. The strike of phallic jouissance is beyond. So perhaps this is something to to be taken into account um, 
uh, in well, that certain, certainly gives us plenty to take into account. The, the, your response might also link up with Tammy Wells' question, but uh, I'll just say we're all aware that we have limited time. We have a question from Susanna Hula. I'm going to take the question from the chat afterwards from Tammy Wells, and then we have uh, an intervention from Gustave de Sol. And then we'll see whether we have room for, for more of these um, questions today or whether they will have to be pursued as we elaborate them across the, across the weeks. Uh, Susanna Hula, did you have a question you wanted to put to Vicente? The question has to do with something you said that shakes a little bit the order I had in my world. Because you said that Lacan leaves the difference between uh, desire and jouissance. Um, and I had the idea that he leaves the centering psychoanalysis in desire to take it to being um, lit by the real of jouissance. But you said more than that. You said that he leaves the difference between the two movements, between the two concepts. And I wanted you to, to say something about that, that uh, for me, it's uh, shaking. Oh, but, uh, exactly what is shaking? The idea you said that Lacan leaves uh, apart or he, he doesn't use anymore the difference between desire and jouissance. Did you say that or it was? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Ah. There, well, Lacan, the classical Lacan said that uh, there is an incompatibility between uh, jouissance and desire. I mean, uh, um, well, no, in, in seminar two, he says that the human desire is perverted because human beings enjoy desire. We enjoy the fact of desiring without acting. Yes. In fact, in this is called by him a kind of perversion. Yeah. Um, in any case, uh, my answer is that um, probably it's a uh, uh, provisional answer, but okay. what we understand is that in this seminar, what leads Lacan to talk about these, four, these forces is the fact that what uh, desire as such has two causes: the the object A as a as that which the lack that pushes that there is something that pushes the desire. Lacan calls it object A. But it is true that we have to understand that this movement, this desire, leads to, points at a jouissance, a plus of jouissance, which is inscribed in the, uh, uh, as such in the four discourses. And it's very important to follow the rotation of this uh, plus of jouissance, the place. Um, so the, uh, there are two causes. There, are, there is no separation in this moment. At this moment in his teaching, there is no separation between uh, the desire and jouissance because there is the, what causes, what pushes desire is the lack. Uh, but, but there is a lack, but this lack is, as Freud said, is the drive with, with that pushes, that impels the subject to, so to search for. To search for what? To, to search for jouissance, satisfaction. And this, both object A and plus of jouissance, which is the, the new, the, the new thing that introduces Lacan here, these two uh, A, the object A and plus of jouissance, operates as a double cause, we could say. There is a double cause. And in this sense, they are not separated. This uh, maybe you you have um, or no maybe but you it's uh, fantastic that you have found in seminar two already we could see uh, an anticipation where Lacan foresees this 
uh, link between the object A and the plus of Juissance. Thank you, Vicente. Um, okay. we'll, we'll move on with, with the other two questions. Funny enough, the question posed by, by Tammy Whale, I think, if I'm saying your name right, Tammy, it, it might be posed almost as a complementary question to this, to the bivalence of object A, because she's asked you just to say something more about this idea of the master signifier in the place of truth maybe in relation to to the impasse of the hysteric position uh, and in relation to the notion of of the the sphinx question and oedipus's answer what can we say about the role played by s1 in the place of truth presumably in in that discourse in in what discourse is the, the well, S it, 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 funny enough will be in the university discourse yes but but she posed the question in relation i think more yes. to to the question of hysteria i don't think if i understand exactly um i think it's very it's, it's an um it's a subtle question so the question is uh, the relationship between the the, on one side, the, the, the hysterical discourse and the, uni, the discourse of the university. Uh -huh. Is it? Is it? Uh, I I, I may of, the place of the S one in in the the, the, the yes. discourse of the university. Yeah. I'm sorry. I, I, to, yes, I, I I may well have garbled Tammy's question a little bit, but but uh, I, for which I apologize. Given the lateness of the hour, could we yeah. then perhaps just move on to Gustavo's intervention and we will think about rounding up today's work and... Well, perhaps and, I, I, I can have this question and answer um, our friend and by, by mail. Yeah. I, I will also take the opportunity to, to mention that we will be keeping a record of the entire chat stream from okay. each of these sessions over the 12 over the 12 weeks so that we I will, can, yeah so that we I will can, see yeah. whether we can create some kind of written trace of the work that's gone alongside the spoken work that's a um, good idea and 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 put it to some kind of compilation work gustave did you have something that you still wanted to say you're on okay. yeah can you listen to me all right Thank you, Vicente. Um, as regards this um, dialectic between desire and jouissance, uh, I think that the funny thing, the tricky thing of the discourse of the hysteria is the fact that uh, eventually there's no desire to know as such at all. Uh, I think that there is the demand, this is the trick of the hysteric. There is uh, the demand that the other knows. Uh, and does the other know? Something that we can uh, post, hmm? because never ever before has the other showed, like today, that there is a real hole in the whole hmm, of knowledge. Uh, so, um, especially if we uh, consider uh, the politicians in the place of the other, the scientifics in the place of the other, and, uh, uh, well, uh, we can realize that, of course, Mm, is the discourse of hysteria has reached its purpose to denounce that there is a, a very deep and ample hole in the other knowledge. Nobody wanted to know anything about the epidemic at first and the pandemic afterwards. The master is castrated. Mm -hmm. 
the master yes is castrated yes mm -hmm. but we are also now castrated it's true what you say uh, the hysteria hysteria shows us that there is no desire to know his her desire the subject's desire is to interest as Lacan says at the end it's very interesting is to interest the other in the other symptom so the question is whether this um, discourse the hysterical discourse is going to be as uh, has been till today is going to maintain this link with the scientific discourse or is going to go to religion to religious discourse that's why i find interesting to to think uh, about this reflection you you have introduced in religion as a way to fill the gap yeah of mm. course because uh, science and logic and even psychoanalysis uh, maintains this maybe this um, unsatisfaction you know, that can lead to the hysterical discourse that can lead the hysterical to religion <clears throat> but I, I just I'm just guessing um, about his um, as a consequence of your your intervention. Could I then <clears throat> thank Gustavo for his intervention and thank Vicente most of all for his efforts to support our our desire and our questioning and provoke a little bit our insatisfaction with 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 the the total knowledge of the answers given that we have been brought to the intersection between desire and and jouissance around this question of the hysterics relation to knowledge i am happy to to announce to all of you that next week next sunday at the same time we will be pursuing the third chapter of this fine seminar, which, as you may well know, is entitled Knowledge as a Means of Jouissance, which will be presented by Florencia Shanahan and commented on by Colin Wright. I have no doubt we will have the opportunity to pursue and elaborate some of these questions next week. I thank Vicente once again and for all of you for your participation. Until next week. Thank you.